for communion this morning, I kind of wanted to continue a line of thought concerning worship that I talked about last week. And, uh, you know, worship, true worship is done in sincerity, truth, uh, in spirit. And I was thinking this week, I was reading a book, and uh, the author brought out a point that... Um, what we often call exciting worship services today, and I kind of think of charismatic, rolling on the floor, hanging from the chandelier, you know, um, what, what, just pure chaos and utter insanity in, some, in many cases. Uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, just look on YouTube, and uh, there's plenty of examples of it. But a lot of people view that as true worship. They view that as true, pure worship of God. And... Um, when in reality, a lot of times, it's just complete, utter chaos. It's, it's fakery. It's nonsense. And, um, you know, we like I mentioned last week, when we worship God, uh, it's not about just the preacher up here preaching something. It's not about just praying for somebody. It's not just about communion or baptism uh, or all those things. It's all those things together. Um, it's not just about setting one day apart from all the others. It, it's it's a, all those things. And really to sum it up, worship is obedience. Now a lot of times in the charismatic type you know, Pentecostal churches, they don't want to hear anything like that. They want to hear worship is rolling around on the floor. And there's less dramatic examples of that. But my point is, is obedience is worship. And I wanted, I wanted to bring an example that came to mind in Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32. And for a little context, Moses has been up on the mountain for a long time. And all the Israelites that saw the parting of the Red Sea, they saw all the plagues, they were getting impatient, as we all know the story. And to sum it up, a worship service broke out. A very exciting one, if you think about it. Let's read verse 1. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods. Elohim is what that word is, which shall go before us, for as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we what not what is become of him. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings, which are in the ears of your wives and your sons and your daughters, and bring them unto me. I want to stop there for a second. We often <laughs> We often say Aaron was peer pressured into this, and I'm sure he was, but the scriptures do not give much context to him fighting back. It seems like, okay, come on, bring him in. But um, let's continue on in verse 3. And all the people break off golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron, and he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graven tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Now, notice in your Bible that Lord is in all caps. So he's using uh, whatever it was, the, the name of God, for this golden calf, which makes this even worse. So he, he's naming this calf after God, um, which wasn't an honor. I don't know. In their mind, they may have thought it would have been an honor, but it wasn't. It was breaking the first and second commandment. Let's read verse 6. And they rose up early on the morning and offered a burnt offering and brought peace offerings. And the people uh, sat down to drink and eat to drink and rose up to play. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down, for thy people which thou brought, broughtest out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. And they have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed there 
thereunto it, and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. And Moses besought the Lord his God, and said, Lord, why doth thy wax, uh, wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief did he bring them out and slay them in the mountains and consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from the, thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Just as a side note, evil there in that passage is just means calamity, not actual evil. Verse 13. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servant, to whom thou swearest by thy own self, and saidest unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of the heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord repented, which means just to change, uh, not that he changed his mind, uh, it's a whole sermon itself, but he changed from what was going to happen of the evil or the calamity which he thought to do unto his people. And Moses turned and went down from the mount, and the two tablets of the testimony were in his hand. And the tablets were written on both si their sides, and on the one side and on the other were they written. The tablets were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God graven upon the tablets. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people they, as they shouted, he said unto Moses, There is a noise of the war in in the camp. And he said, It is not the voice of them that shout it for mastery, neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but noise of them that sing, do I hear? So they're singing. They're having a party. Uh, they're, they're, it's a pretty exciting worship service. I mean, it says they're worshiping. It's, a, it's an exciting worship service that's going on that Moses comes down. They're singing, they're dancing, I imagine. Uh, if we've ever watched the Ten Commandments with, uh, with uh, you know, Charlton Heston, uh, when he came down off the mountain in the movie, it was like that way too. It was everyone just a mess. Let's continue reading on in verse uh, 19. And it came to pass, as soon as he came nigh unto the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing, and Moses' anger waxed hot, and he cast the tablets out of his hand and brake them beneath the mount. And he took the calf which they had made and burned it in fire and ground it into power, powder and strawed it up under the water and made the children of Israel drink it. And Moses said unto Aaron, What did this people unto thee? And that thou hast brought us so a great sin upon them. And Aaron said, Let not the anger of my Lord wax hot. Thou knowest thy people that they are set on mischief. For they said unto me, Make us gods, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought up us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. Now we'll just stop right there for a minute. Um, well, actually, no, let's, let's continue reading on. Let's continue reading on because it gets a little worse here. Uh, it gives us a, bit, a more vivid image. Um, verse 24. And I said unto them, Whosoever hath any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it to me, that then I cast it unto the fire, there came out this calf. And when Moses saw that the people were naked, so they're naked now, they're dancing around naked, for Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies, then Moses stood... What it means is, is Moses, uh, Aaron revealed to them what had happened. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. And he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out from the gate to gate throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother, and every man his champion, and every man his neighbor, excuse me, can't, companion, not champion, companion, and every man his neighbor, and the 
the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. Now we'll stop right there. That's an exciting worship service. I mean, there's dancing, there's singing, there's possibly figuratively or literally people naked running around. There's golden calves being made. But it was a sin. It was wrong. It was breaking the first and the second commandment. And um, Moses was so mad, he took the tablets and he broke them, which he should have done that. That was wrong, too. Um, but his, his anger, he got just mad by seeing it. And um, today, though, with many of the so-called worship services, there's really no difference. I mean, in many cases, they, they're worshiping, they're not even worshiping the true living God. They're worshiping something else. Um, what it is is up for debate. You know, a lot of people, uh, they think they're worshiping the true and living God, but they're not, they don't read the Bible. They don't learn from their Bible. They don't find out who He really is. And with all that being said, I want to turn to um, Matthew chapter 28. I'm sorry, not 28. 26. Because when we come and take communion, it, it, it's an act of worship. It's an act of obedience. And to some, it's not very exciting. You know, that's not very you know, exciting to me. But we do it because it was, it was a command. It was something that we were told to do, and it's an act of worship. And if He, if he tells us to do it, and we do it, we're honoring Him, we're serving Him, we're worshiping Him in that, in spirit and in truth. And we can roll around the floor naked with fires and dance and, and make golden calves, but that's not worship, even if we say that's the Lord's worship, which is what they did. Um, and oftentimes, you know, people don't want that. They don't want the plain, true, plain worship of God. They want something else. They want, another, they want a golden calf in many cases. But here in Matthew chapter 26, when Jesus instituted the ordinance of communion, as it's called, it says here, and we're going to do this as a memorial. That's what this is. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body. And He took the cup and He gave thanks in giving it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And we know from this point on that the, new, uh, the first century Christians, they took communion regularly. Uh, there's debate on how frequent, but they took it as a memorial, uh, like we read about in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Um, it, was, it was in remembrance of something. And uh, as I've mentioned before around Passover time, you, normally if God tells us to remember something, it's because He knows we're prone to forget it. And uh, that's the case with a lot of these things in Scripture. We're prone to forget it if we're not reminded of it. Uh, Zant, would you mind passing out communion? Now, uh, this is going to be uh, part eight of the verse by verse series in the book of Proverbs. Uh, a lot of this, uh, some of this is going to be a review, some of it not. Um, I, I'm finding, you know, you don't, you don't really pay attention much to it when you're, when you're just reading it. But when you're putting a sermon together, you find out how many things are repeated over and over and over again in the book of Proverbs. Um, but we're going to be going through chapter 7 and 8 this morning. And it says here, um, and in this passage, we're going to be talking about, it kind of takes up where we left off, talking about the many different forms of adultery, and uh, which I think we've covered well to this point, so we're going to glance over a lot of that. But it says here in verse 1 through 5, My son, keep my words and lay up my commandments with thee. Keep my commandments and live, and my law as the apple of thine eye. Bind them upon thy fingers, and write them upon the tablet of thine heart. Say unto, the, say unto wisdom, Thou art my sister, and calling understanding thy kinswoman, that they may keep thee from the strange woman, from the stranger which flattereth her with her, flattereth with her lips." 
Um, once again, there's reminders here of keeping God's law, His commandments, first and foremost in front of us. Bind them around our heart, write them on the tablet of our heart, um, things of that nature. And the heart's another word for mind. So when it says here, write them upon the tablet of thine heart, it's talking about your mind. It's talking about studying. I mean, it's how we write them in our mind is when we study. And uh, so this is a call to study God's law, which is something that's not very popular today, is people don't want to study God's law to figure out what God wants us to do and what He doesn't want us to do. And they'd rather just uh, do what they want in many cases. But here's a command here to write these laws, write these commandments on the tablet of our mind, uh, our heart. And uh, that's what we're to do as soon as much as we can. Now let's look at verse 4 and 5 again, because uh, there's something really interesting here that's said. It says here, Say unto wisdom, Thou art my sister, call understanding thy kinswoman, that they may keep thee from the strange, zur, that's the Hebrew word zur, woman, from the stranger, that's nokery, which flattereth with her lips. Now, we've already talked about this many times, but I wanted to point this out in this passage here because it contrasts kinswoman, and this is the same kinswoman and kinsman like used in the book of Ruth and things like that, with a nokery stranger, which we know is a racial stranger. So here's a, an opposite given. You have kinswoman being presented and then a someone that's not of your people being presented. And in the context of this passage, it's not just the harlot that's being spoken about, but the, the stranger, the strange woman. So that means that adultery covers both harlotry and what we would call miscegenation in those passages. Um, and most people will glance over that and not even notice it, but they're contrast right there. And that same Hebrew word, nokri, is used in like Nehemiah and Ezra. Um, and it's used in the passage that says that you should not have a stranger rule over you, but you should have your brother rule over you in the law. Uh, that same word. So those are lumped together. And I find that very interesting that the harlot and the strange woman, in the case of, of adultery, or man, if it be that way, are lumped together throughout the Proverbs. We've seen that multiple times. And I know that may not be... Um, a big deal to a lot of people, but if you look around in our nation today, you see both of those things lumped together often by the same people. Now let's look at verse 6 through 13. It says here, For at the window of my house I looked through my casement, and beheld among the simple ones I discerned among the youths a young man void of understanding. Stupid person, basically. Continue on passing through the streets near her corner. And he went the way of her house, and in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and the dark night. And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of a harlot, and subtle of heart. She is loud and stubborn. Her feet abide not in her house. She is without, now in the streets, and lieth in wait at every corner. She caught him and kissed him, and with an impute face said unto him, now, we'll stop there for just a second. We have a scene of harlotry here. I don't have to expound on it too much. It's not unlike what you'd see in, well, at one point it'd be Las Vegas, but now it's like any other town now. But here in verse 14 and 15, it says this. This is what she says. I have a peace offering with me. This day I have paid my vows. Therefore came I forth to meet thee, diligently to seek thy face, and I have found thee. Now this is really interesting because this term, I have a peace offering, comes from the law. Uh, it comes directly from Leviticus chapter 3, verse 1, which is concerning the law. So she's putting on almost like a cloak of right righteousness here. She's, she's presenting herself almost as something that she's not. Uh, I want to read a quote here from Albert Barnes. He wrote about this. And, um, and to be honest, that's where I learned about it at because I had never really paid much attention to when she said, I have a peace offering. It didn't make much sense to me. But he points out this. This, this is what he had to say. The harlot uses the technical word Leviticus 3.1 for the peace offerings. 
and makes them the straight point for her sin. They have to be eaten on the same day that they, have, they are offered. Leviticus 7, 15 through 7, 16. And she invites her victim to the feast. She who speaks is a foreigner who, under a show of conformity to the religion of Israel, still remains her old excuse me, still retains her old notions. And a feast day to her is nothing but a time of self-indulgence, which she may invite another to share with her. If we assume as probable that these harlots of Jerusalem were mainly of Phoenician origin, the connection of their worship with their sin would be but the continuation of their original cultus. Uh, he's speaking of Canaanites, basically, is what he's speaking about when he says Phoenicians. Um, there's a little bit of mis misunderstanding with that, but that's what he's, he's speaking of. Um, now I want to read a quote from the 1599 Geneva Bible in the footnotes. It says this, Because in peace offerings a portion is returned to them that offered, she shows him that she has meat at home to make good cheer with or else she would use some cloak of holiness till she had gotten him in her snare, which declares that harlots outwardly will seem holy and religious, both because they may better deceive others and also thinking to observe ceremonies and offerings to make sanctification for their sins. Now think about that. The way she used that, that wording and what they had to say on this cloak of righteousness. And think about how many examples we have today of people who put on cloaks of righteousness to trick others. Usually to ensnare them in a trap. Um, first of mind, you know, uh, politicians. They do it all the time. They'll put up a cloak of righteousness and then what is it? Six months down the line, you find out they're in some scandal, or they they lied about what their all their campaign promises were, or or this, that, or the other. They put up a cloak of righteousness, and they seemed holy. They held up a Bible. They they said they were Christian when they don't even know what the term is. Uh, happens all the time. Um, preachers they do it all the time. Put up a cloak of righteousness. Put on a, a wolf's cloak, a wolf's and sheep's clothing. Get a, they get up behind a pulpit and they sit there and talk about things that trick the congregation into believing things that aren't true. Or they trick the congregation into just being happy. That way they can fill the tithe, tithe plate at the end of the day, whatever it may be. And they can't say anything else because they don't want to get out that comfort zone. Um, it's cloaks of righteousness. Um, it happens all around us, all the time. People in wolves and sheep's clothing. And that's what's being spoken about here. Now let's look at uh, verse 16 and onward. Um, it says here, uh, I'm not going to expound much on this, and then we're going to jump into um, chapter 8. But it says here, I have decked my bed with the covering of tapestries, with the carved works with fine linen of Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with loves, for the good man is not at home. He is gone a long journey. He, take, he hath taketh, taken a bag of money with him, and will come home at the appointed day, a day appointed. With her much fair speech, she caused him to yield. With the flattering of her lips, she forced him. He goeth after her straightway as an ox goeth to the slaughter, or as a fool to the correction of the stocks. Till a dart strike through his liver, as a bird hasten to the snare, knoweth not that it is for his life. Hearken unto me now, therefore, O ye children, attend to the words of my mouth. Let not thine heart decline to her ways. Go not astray in her paths, for she hath cast down many wounded. Yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Her house is the way of hell going down to the chambers of death. So, to sum it up, that sin leads to death. Very vivid way of putting it. <coughs> now let's go to chapter 8. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 1 through 12 we're going to read. Doth not wisdom cry, and understanding put forth her voice? She standeth in the top of the high places, by the way in the places of the past. 
She cries at the gates, at the entry of the city, and at the coming in at the doors. Unto you, O men, I call, and my voice is to the sons of men. O ye simple, understand wisdom, and ye fools, be ye of an understanding heart. Hear, for I will speak of an excellent thing, and the opening of my lips shall be right things. For my mouth shall speak truth, and wickedness is an abomination to my lips. All the words of my mouth are in the righteousness. There is nothing forward or perverse in them. They are in all plain to him that understandeth, and a right to them that findeth knowledge. Receive my instruction, not silver, and no knowledge rather than the choice gold. For wisdom is better than rubies, and all the things that may be desired are not to be compared to it. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence, and find out knowledge of witty intentions. Inventions, excuse me. Basically, this is wisdom speaking in a figurative way, being wrote about. And we're to attain to wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And verse 13, the very next verse, really harkens back to what we were talking about last week on what the Lord hates, is a way that we find wisdom. It says here, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, arrogancy, in the evil way. And the forward mouth do I hate. Now, I meant to bring this verse up last week, and I, I forgot. I had wrote it down in some notes, and then when I went back, I, after I preached the sermon, I realized I had missed it. But we were talking about last week about how the things that God hates. And in the previous chapter, there was, uh, in chapter 6 actually, there was the, this six things that God hates, and one's the abomination, and, and the Septuagint doesn't say six. It just says these are all the things that God hates, or these... Uh, all things God hates. And um, if you remember in part one of this series, in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, it says this concerning the fear of the Lord, or the reverence of the Lord. It says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So you can't have knowledge, true knowledge, true wisdom, true instruction, unless you fear God. And then here in verse 13 of chapter 8, it says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, arrogancy, and the evil way in the forward mouth do I hate. So you can't even get on the street to knowledge, wisdom, and understanding unless you first fear the Lord. And fearing of the Lord is to hate all these things that God hates. But if you ask your average professing Christian, should you hate anything, they're going to tell you no. Which, if you look at many of them and how they act, they don't hate evil in many cases. Not all of them, but in many cases they don't hate evil. Because they don't hold back the corruption. They don't hold back the wicked way. In fact, in many cases, a lot of churches that are anti-nomian, anti-law, they've done away with the Ten Commandments completely. They don't believe in them anymore. Um, if you do that, then how can you hate the evil way, the pride, arrogancy, the forward mouth? Uh, you can't. In order to get on the path of knowledge, wisdom, understanding, we have to hate the evil, the evil things. For a few more examples, let's turn to Job chapter 28. Let's turn to Job chapter 28. It says here, And unto man he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. So the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and the opposite of that is to depart from evil. So depart from evil is understanding. So you can't have understanding, you can't have the fear of the Lord, can't have wisdom, unless all these things go together. They're all a package deal. You can't pick wisdom, knowledge, and understanding and also not hate the evil ways, hate the wickedness. Now let's go to Psalm 111, verse 10. Psalm 111, verse 10. It says this, concerning the fear of the Lord, and uh, once again connects fear of the Lord with knowledge, wisdom, and keeping God's commandments. It says here, 
The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do His commandments. His praise endureth forever. Let's read it again. For the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding. So you have good understanding. Have all they that do His commandments. So you link in God's commandments once again with good understanding, knowledge, wisdom. Now let's go to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. In verse 31, concerning the, the early Christians in the first century, it says here, Then had the churches rest through all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and were edified, and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. Now, I'm not trying to make this too dumb, but I want to nail it home. How does a congregation fear the Lord? Oh, by walking in the ways of the Lord, by hating the things that God hates, hating the wicked way, hating the perverse tongue. Uh, that's how a congregation walks, like we hear in the book of Acts, walks in the fear of the Lord. How does a congregation get knowledge, wisdom, understanding? How does a Christian do all these things? By fearing the Lord and doing all those things which God commanded. It's all interconnected. And different sects of Christianity, they like to compartmentalize things. You know, we, we want the law, we don't want the law, we want wisdom, knowledge, understanding, we want to fear the Lord, but we don't want these things. Uh, the Bible in God's way is not a la carte. Have you all ever ordered something a la carte at a restaurant? It's usually more expensive. You know, I remember we'd go to Cracker Barrel and I wanted, um, back when they did, turkey sausage. I'd want a biscuit and, and a some biscuits and some uh, turkey sausage. And uh, that's not on the menu, but if you order it, it comes a la carte. Well, when you get your bill, it's a whole lot more expensive than anything on the menu because it's a la carte. Uh, I don't know why. But uh, the Bible's not that way. You can't order this and that. You have to stick to the menu, so to speak. And uh, if not, you get off, off the trail. You get off in the ditch. Let's go to now... Um, so, uh, Proverbs chapter tw uh, 8, and let's read verse 14 through 20. And that's why we need to improve ourselves. None of us are perfect. None of us are doing everything right. We improve ourselves every, every day, every week, and we get a little bit better. It says here, Counsel is mine, speaking of wisdom, and sound wisdom. I am understanding. I have strength. By me reigns king, king's reign, and princes decree justice. By me princes rule, and nobles even all the judges of the earth. I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. Riches, honor are with me, yeah, durable riches in righteousness. My fruit is better than gold, yeah, than fine gold. My revenue, than choice silver. I lead in the way of righteousness, in the midst of the path of judgment. Now, this is speaking of wisdom. Now, do kings truly reign through wisdom? A good king does. Do princes administer justice through wisdom? A good prince does. Now, we already know in America today, when you take wisdom, knowledge, understanding from the leaders, what that makes. It makes the mess that we're in today. Chaotic out of order, um, a sinful nation. Um, they don't have the true knowledge, wisdom, and understanding that they, that they need, that a leader needs. You can't have that unless you're following God's law. If you're following God's way, hate the evil way. That's why I get so aggravated with all the people that promote all you know, politicians like Trump, like he's going to save us all, when, yes, you know, gas prices may get cheaper. The, the, ta the stock market did go up last week. Um, but him and his cabinet are not hating the evil thing. In fact, more than likely, I will probably end up at war with some Arabs here before too long because just look at the people that they're picking to run this administration. Those people are not hating the evil way. They're beating war drums uh, to go fight for their idols, their golden calves. Um, is that sound wisdom, knowledge, and understanding? Nope, it's not. It's the complete opposite. 
Um, and unfortunately, people, Christians, professing Christians, would prefer to have it that way. And it's sad. Uh, they would prefer to have it that way because it's the, they're like the people that we spoke about during communion at the base of Mount Sinai. They don't like God's way. Moses is taking too long. So we're going to do it our own way. How did it end with the 3,000 men at the end? They all ended up dead. When we divert from God's way, I know this is just Sunday school basic material. When we return from God's way, uh, depart from God's way, it never ends well for us. Now let's look at verse 21 through 32. That I may cause those that love me to inherit substance, and I will fill their treasures. I want to stop there for a moment. Wisdom has something to do with inheriting substance and filling their treasures. Probably because people that have wisdom, knowledge, and understanding are wise. They can handle, them, handle their household, their goods, their finances, their checkbook. Um, just, just a side note there. Um, if you don't know basic math, that is, uh, you can't spend more than you have coming in. Your, your, your substance ends up messing up. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of His way. So the Lord possessed wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Before His works of old, I was set up from the everlasting, from the beginning, or the ever the earth was. When there was no depths, I was brought forth. When there was no fountains abound with water. Before the mountains were settled, before the hills were was I brought forth, while as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world, when he prepared the heavens. I was there when he set a compass upon the face of the depth, when he established the clouds above, when he straightened the fountains of the deep, when he gave to the sea his decree that the waters should not pass his commandment. When he appointed the foundations of the earth, then I was by him, as one brought up with him. And I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the habitation part of his earth. And my delight were with the sons of men. Now therefore hearken unto me, O ye children, for blessed are they that keep my ways." Now, I thought this was kind of neat, because think about it here. If you could put wisdom, knowledge, and understanding in a box, you know, what little that we can obtain in our lifetime, if you can put it in a box, if you could, that is the same material, the same power, same substance, whatever you want to call it, that God used to create the universe. Now, I know that's a little bit wide thinking, but if you could put whatever wisdom, knowledge, and understanding is, if you could put it in a box, that's the same thing God used to do all His work. Um, and we, and I've brought this out before, you know, white men in particular, and women, they like to create things. They like to make things. They like to take dominion. Uh, they like to make a cow or a chicken do what they want, even though it sometimes doesn't w uh, work out for them in that favor. Uh, they like to take a piece of wood and carve it into something that they envisioned in their mind. They like to take whatever, clay, um, glass, and form it into something that they had envisioned. And I think that's part, part of that is from our Creator, because not everybody has that ability. Uh, not everybody has that the desire to create something. And when we do create something, we, and we all have the ability, just some of us just haven't found it. I used to not think I had the ability, and then, you know, uh, it comes along. But um, God, that's part of God, that, that power, that desire to take something from nothing and make it into something is something from God. And it takes knowledge, wisdom, and understanding to do that. Um, for example, I'm not a very good woodworker. Zant's a whole lot better than me. Uh, I've, I've learned a lot from woodworking from Zant, and he learned it from his grandfather. Um, and neither of us are really, really good, but he's a whole lot better than me, and, uh, and I'm sure there's somebody worse than me. Now let's read verse 33 through 36. 
Hear instruction, and be wise. Refuse it not. Blessed is the man that heareth me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at the post of my doors. For whosoever findeth me, findeth life, and shall obtain favor of the Lord. But he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All they that hate me love death. Now, let's, I'm going to read that whole passage, but a little different. Hear instruction and be wise, and refuse not wisdom. Blessed is the man that heareth wisdom, watching daily at my gates for wisdom, waiting at the post of my doors for wisdom. For whosoever findeth me, findeth life, and not death, and shall obtain the favor of the Lord. But he that sinneth against me, now we're talking about the Lord, Wrongeth his own soul, it means life. Soul means life. And all they that hate me love death. So if you hate wisdom, which you can't get, hate wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, which you can't get unless you're obeying God's law, you love death. And we know that sin is a transgression of God's law, and through sin, death came into the world. So it's all interconnected. I hope that makes sense, uh, how... Something as simple as just learning a little precept of God in the Bible can lead to life in some way in our life or lead to us living a better life or living a way that is contrary to the way of death, which is everywhere in our country today. And um, a lot of times because people don't want to follow the ways of God. They don't want to obey Him. And I know I've hearkened on that a bunch uh, over the past couple years. And I'm going to continue doing it because God's law is our way. It's our path. If, we're not, if I'm not up here preaching on that, I, there isn't a whole lot to be preaching on. So let's, uh, that's all i got today. Let's go ahead and bow our heads and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank You, Lord, for this time together, Lord, to come before You and read Your Word. We ask you, Lord, to forgive us of our sins. Let us do better this upcoming week than we did the last. Let us be better Christian men and women of God. That way we may be found worthy, Lord, to, be, to have your name upon us. We praise you and we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen.